Blessed be our God. Forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. God, whose blessed Son came into the world that he might destroy the works of the devil and make us children of God and heirs of eternal life. Grant that having this hope, we may purify ourselves as he is pure, that when he comes again with power and great glory, we may be made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the letter of Paul to Titus. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that is in accordance with godliness, in the hope of eternal life that God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. In due time, he revealed his word through the proclamation with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. To Titus, my loyal child in the faith, we share. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. I left you behind in Crete for this reason, so that you should put in order what remained to be done and should appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Someone who is blameless, married only once, whose children are believers, not accused of debauchery and not rebellious. For a bishop, as God's steward, must, not be, must be blameless. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or addicted to wine or violent or greedy for gain, but he must be hospitable, a lover of goodness, prudent, upright, devout, and self-controlled. He must have a firm grasp of the word that is trustworthy in accordance with the teaching so that he may be both able to preach with sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict it. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Yeah. 
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to anyone by whom they come. It would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If another disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender. And if there is repentance, you must forgive. And if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. The word of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please have a seat. It is so good and an honor to be here with you today. I mean, y'all do this all the time, so you don't know what a big deal it is to preach on Monday morning. <laughs> I think that the only thing that might surpass this might be the National Cathedral on a Sunday morning. <laughs> but it is such an honor to be here with you. Such a joy to be here with you. As I was looking at our text for the morning, I was thinking that, you know, I don't often question the wisdom of God, but I actually do think God speaks through the lectionary. And I thought, these are fine texts, God, for us to be considering on a day that is probably the most consequential election in the most powerful nation on the face of the earth in the lifetime of many who have been gathered. But these are our texts. So this morning, I want to spend a little bit of time reflecting on a simple word, and that is the word and. But before I do, I invite you to join me in prayer. Merciful and loving God, we're ever grateful that you give us your word as a lamp unto our feet, a gift to our understanding, and an encouragement to our soul. We ask that a word preached this morning might encourage some heart, give someone strength to go on just a little while longer, and to see what it is that you would have for them to be just a little clearer. All this we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I want to talk about the word and for a moment, particularly the use of the word as a suffix for our scripture this morning. All three of them. Scripture which finds its retelling as guidance for the Christian life, particularly that of people who would be leaders among the faithful, people like you. Particularly that of people who will guide us into the future. So in this way, the word, uh, words have become timeless, these texts that we've heard. As we consider them this morning, I invite you to place them back in their context, because I think we can see something if we place them back in their context and not simply treat them as a timeless admonition for what the quality of life of a Christian leader ought to be. Because what I want to suggest and spend just a little bit of time talking about is that if we step back for a moment and look at them in the context and then sort of ask what that might mean for today, what we will discover is that these words in Titus, these words in the psalmist, the words from Jesus are necessary for the Christian life, but they are insufficient for good Christian leadership. So they are necessary but insufficient. Now I want us to step back, and some of you have had Bibles, so we're going to step back into the Sitz and Laban 
of the text and from which they emerge. And if we do that, I think there's something that we'll discover, that these are basically rules for not being a putz. <laughs> and the point we want to note is that this movement, in its context, was a new movement who were, that was reviled by both the Jews and the Romans. They sought every opportunity to portray the Christians as degenerates, willing to undermine the social order with these, their new customs and new religious devotion. So what we find in these texts, particularly the rules, were basically just the rules to be a good citizen, a good neighbor, and an exemplar of the faith. And that's all. In a world in which the faith and the faithful were denigrated each and every day. So why do I want to take note of this? these words, these phrases, these ways of learning that have become a bedrock for Christian personal morality that reflects into the public. Why take note of Jesus' admonition for the way we ought to treat each other as neighbors? Why can't I just leave the text as it is? It's clear enough. Why take note of God's desire for the faithful to have a clean heart? Why would we notice these things at all? Well, first, we notice them because the great theologian Margaret Schuster in her book, Power, Pathology, and Paradox, reminds us that the devil hides in the structure of things and not in the human heart. So if we're only looking at the human heart, we will miss what the devil is doing in the world. The devil hides in the details of systems of oppression in the ideologies that support them, in the ideological formations that give them power. The devil hides in the details of systems that distort human relationality, that create ideas about what divides us instead of how it is that we're all God's children. That's where the devil hides, not in the human heart. The devil hides in the details of broken relationality, and by hiding in the details, by hiding in the details, the devil is actually able to subvert the good that personal holiness would seek to cultivate in the world. Right? Because the way we have our personal identity, the way we understand what it means to be in the world is given to us by our society. The society that has been shaped by the currents of history, the society that has been shaped by the ways in which humans have lived. So when that gets distorted, our hearts will become distorted as well. Think of the hundreds of letters and tomes written in defense of slavery by good Christian slaveholders who had exemplary lives and who we have monuments and I dare say feast days to remember them. Think of the tens of thousands of good Germans, good Christian Germans, who betrayed their Jewish neighbors into annihilation. These were all good folk that went to church and were fine upstanding people in their communities. No one spoke a word against them, but at the hour that God called on them, they followed what was in their heart and betrayed their neighbors into annihilation. Think of the good Christian folk who settled the West by genocide and ethnic cleansing. And every time the Indians had been removed, what was the first thing they built after the saloon? A church. My point is not to commend a life of selfish intoxication, hedonism to anyone. It is to notice that without a critical and, so that we never think these are enough, there is always so much more that we can do. Without a critical and, the human heart, the Christian heart, becomes too easily satisfied with itself. Right, the end is what we materialize in the world after we stop worrying about what's in our heart. What kind of world 
does the inclination of our heart build? If we're not attentive to that and we simply look at being a fine, upstanding person, then we'll actually reflect all of the fallenness that is within our society. Now, too often, these questions of what it is that our lives will be, what they will mean after we stop focusing on just what's happening within our heart, too often these questions are muted by a solipsistic approach to the faith that stops with how we are in the world, but resists the further issue of what our, wor of what our being means in the world. So not just how are you in the world, but there's actually material effect in the world because you are alive. So what does that mean? What does your life mean? What is being materialized in your life? Put differently, we should presume that our text for the morning create a baseline, and that is all, a baseline for our lives and are neither accomplishments nor the sumum bonum of the Christian life. If we take the baseline to be sufficient, we may find ourselves not up to the moment in which we live. We may find that our lives become projects of circumscription, an unrealized consequence that could have done good in the world, but actually did nothing because we were so concerned about being upstanding in the eyes of the world. If we, live, if, if we live our lives seeking something larger than personal satisfaction of doing the baseline, our lives can mean something and have consequences we could never have imagined. If we do not settle for the least that we can do with our lives, but actually look for the more that we can do with our lives, we might indeed change the world. We, you and I, today, on Monday, before a very important day, stand upon a precipice because too many have held a faith that simply focused on being a good Christian in a limited sort of way. Their hearts have been vacuums to be filled with racial grievance animus toward the stranger, transphobia, and lethal patriarchy. And too many others have held their hearts and lives as hostage to their pocketbooks. Of the many things that we need to think about what the world ought to be, 10 cent more a gallon for gas should not be what motivates us to call the doom upon our sisters and brothers who are different from ourselves. If our society is to have a future of hope and generosity, we must have something more than a baseline Christianity. As a part of it, we must have leaders who call people beyond self-satisfaction of the heart. We must have people whose hearts long for something more than what is, long for more than being prisoners of a nostalgia of a time rife with injustice. We must have people whose hearts long for a time when the poor will no longer be among us because everyone will be filled. We must have people who long for in their hearts a time when the captive and the oppressed will be set free to enjoy the fullness of God's bounty and every tear will be wiped away. In a word, we must have a people, and we must lead people to find the courage to live in such a way where the baseline will never be enough for them because they know that with God, there is always more. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for the church and the world. 
Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. God of love and mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. God of love and mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. God of love and mercy, hear our prayer. With thankful hearts, especially for the marriage of Laura and Henry, and for the ordination of Katie, we ask you to bless all those whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them, and love one another as he loves us. God of love and mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the students of our seminary. Bless Katie Campbell and Catherine Volk and all who study in this place. God of love and mercy, hear our prayer. We also give thanks for all who labor to further the mission of the seminary. Bless Madeline Snodgrass and all those who labor in this place. God of love and mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially Stacy, Taylor, Thatcher Stone, and Kaylin Shelton. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. God of love and mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with them and all your saints in your eternal kingdom. God of love and mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, who created us in your own image, grant us grace to contend against evil and to make no peace with oppression that we may reverently use our freedom, help us to employ it in the maintenance of justice in our communities and among the nations. To the glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God. God of all mercy, Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
With you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and a good and joyful thing to give you thanks, all holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. You have filled us and all creation with your blessing and fed us with your constant love. You have redeemed us in Christ Jesus and knit us into one body. Through your spirit, you replenish us and call us to fullness of life. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we sing. God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we failed to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us, and so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation 
this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of all your children, that with all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
on page 55. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Now send us forth a people forgiven, healed, renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated.